Hello, we have another issue with a breakdown of the main events in the world and analytics on them. What will we be talking about today? The main news is, of course, the massive missile attack on the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. And, according to Ukrainian officials, this is the most powerful attack in recent times. And, of course, the footage from the Dnepropetrovsk hydroelectric power plant, here and after. Dnepro HPP, with the facilities of the Dnepro HPP itself being hit, became public, the fire is very serious, and I think that this can be considered a certain hint to Zelensky, but will he understand it and will the shelling of Belgorod stop or not, here, unfortunately. My conclusions will be unambiguous, I think that Zelensky will not understand the consequences, we will be discussing this with you today, but in the Pentagon, and in principle, the American administration has started talking about the fact that the Ukrainian armed forces will have to make difficult decisions, all of this is related to the retreat of the Ukrainian army. Our geopolitical analysis today will also include a statement from Italy and a statement from Australia, we will look at how these statements demonstrate to us the split in the Western coalition, we'll talk about this and more in today's edition, also today we will discuss the harsh statements against the French from the representative of Russia. I would like to show you this fragment and explain why such rigidity, rigidity in this case with regard to France is simply necessary, and we are going to begin. So, we begin, as is tradition, with current events, today, another shelling of Belgorod, the shelling practically does not stop, and today, at the time of recording this video clip, it is already known that one woman who had just gone for a walk with her dog was killed as a result of shelling by the armed forces of Ukraine, here and after, AFU. But these are the images that have gone viral, here you can see the next damage, and every time you watch these images, you must realize that the risk of death as a result of such strikes is quite high for the residents of Belgorod, here you can see just destruction of property of ordinary Russian citizens, but there could be a person in this car at this moment, or someone could just pass by or get into the car at this moment. They're just hitting residential yards, at the same time, we have sad news from the Graveron City District, just to give you a sense of what it looks like, take a look at this picture, this is one of the most beautiful provincial towns in Russia with a very interesting history. And now the residents are forced to leave it, and the official authorities are already calling for it, however, one should always remember that not everyone agrees to such a voluntary evacuation, especially the elderly, they prefer the option of remaining under threat to their lives rather than leaving their homes, Gennady Bondarev, head of the administration of the Graveron Urban District of Belgorod region, regularly shelled by the AFU, urged residents to leave for safety reasons, yes. This is the situation here, so the situation in Belgorod, unfortunately, is not getting better, next, a hint to Zelensky, in my opinion, such a bright signal, stop shelling civilians in Belgorod. This is a strike under the Dnepropetrovsk hydroelectric power plant, if I start reading you the bulletin now, you will be very much surprised at the scale of this attack. Let me probably do it anyway, a powerful blow to the Zaporozhye region, the Dnieper hydroelectric power plant has been attacked, about 12 missile strikes on Zaporozhye. Kharkov is blacked out, there were more than 15 strikes in the city, in Krivoy Rog schedule of emergency shutdowns. There is a hit to critical infrastructure, in Kropivnitsky disappeared electricity in a number of neighborhoods. On Vinitsa region strikes, on the objects of energy infrastructure of ivano frankivsk region, in the Poltava region hit, in Khmelnytsky there are attacks on critical infrastructure, in Lviv there are strikes on energy infrastructure facilities, there are severe power outages in Poltava region. According to some reports, there are strikes on thermal power plants in Vinnytsia and in Kharkiv region, this is the minimum summary, what else do we know about the strikes, I take this information from Ukrainian official sources, unofficial sources, Russian statements, I summarize everything and get this picture of what is happening, of course. At the same time Ukraine in its traditional manner said that all the missiles had been shot down, again, practically all of them have been shot. Down, 90% have been shot down, this is, of course, ridiculous to hear. 
You know what's interesting, exactly which facilities and targets were hit, apparently, Zelensky again removed the air defense from covering the energy infrastructure, and here was this test, is this really true? And, of course, a signal to Zelensky, is it possible to destroy the Dnieper hydroelectric dam? What we have seen with the Kakovskaya HPP shows that in principle, it is possible. The only thing is that the situation then was connected, in my opinion, with a very difficult period. Of regular shelling by the AFU, at that time, Russia was not interested in Kakovskaya HPP ceasing to exist, because after the dam was blown up, all our fortifications were washed away, again. More damage was done to the lower bank, which was controlled by Russia, in the case of the Dnieper HPP, can this be considered a certain signal to Zelensky, here the territory is not controlled by us and the consequences will be quite serious, is it possible to hit and how many missiles will be needed, here again, there are tons of concrete protecting the dam, which means that a serious number of missiles will be needed. But again, if Russia really wants to make such a political decision, it is possible to realize it in this case by military means, if you overload the Ukrainian air defense system, if you accumulate enough missiles, Russia is capable of destroying absolutely any object. The issue here is simply the proportionality of spending resources to the effect of destroying this object, or here you and I can observe an attempt to demonstrate to Zelensky that it is time to stop, as I said at the beginning, shelling Belgorod. Will Zelensky listen to this? No, why not, because he absolutely does not care about the fate of the citizens of his country, he absolutely does not care what happens and what will be the consequences, even now there is shelling going on, but no one will ask why infrastructure is being attacked, what is going on at all, there are only rare voices. They are now being heard from the West about Ukraine saying that it is simply pointless to go on with this. Let's summarize, I think, unfortunately, that Zelensky's reaction will in no way reflect what is really going on in his head. Maybe he will actually be afraid that the next strike will finally be on the centers of political decision-making. That very Bankova, or the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine. Maybe even here Zelensky will not experience a drop of fear and will simply come out with another statement that look. Russia attacked us. Give us more weapons. Most likely, this scenario is the most probable, unfortunately, the Ukrainian armed forces will not, in my opinion, stop shelling Belgorod in this connection. Well, let's move on with you, the next topic is difficult decisions for Ukraine, this is what Mr. Americans are telling us, let us look at this fragment. We know Ukraine right now is having to make strategic decisions about having to withdraw um, from certain uh, areas in order to fortify their defensive lines. Um, those are really hard, tough decisions and, and decisions that they're having to make because we are not able to supply them with um, the capabilities, the systems that they need because we don't have that authorization from Congress. So um, the best way we can support Ukraine is to have Congress pass a supplemental so we can continue to draw down um, these packages. And you've heard the, the Secretary of Defense, he was just, um, he just convened the Ukraine Defense Contact Group earlier this week and he said very forcefully that we're not gonna let Ukraine fail. And we're not, but we do need Congress's help in order to get Ukraine what it needs. Yeah. So, so no sending, there's no intention to send in the, in the near future at least any troops. President Biden has been very clear that there will be no boots on the ground in Ukraine. So, where do we stand on these statements about not easy solutions for Ukraine? They can be understood in different ways. The first is another pressure on the American Congress to approve aid. And, accordingly, option two is simply preparing American public opinion for the fact that the AFU will begin to retreat. What territories can be left behind? I think that no one will run for the Dnieper, it is still early. Well, and, in fact, it is likely to be really a retreat to larger fortified settlements, that is to say, that the front is about to collapse is out of the question, how are things going with aid to Ukraine, 
that's exactly what the Pentagon is talking about, Sabrina Singh, she is the Deputy Press Secretary of the Pentagon and she is trying to put such pressure on the American Congress. And there we have our almost beloved Speaker Johnson, while he's still our favorite, while he's blocking American aid to Ukraine, and then he'll be our worst enemy again, but for now, we sympathize with him, what's he doing here? He said aid to Ukraine won't be taken up in the House until at least April 9, they return to session after the break, but now they will go on Easter recess and will not return until April 9, that said, Speaker Johnson, who of course sympathizes with Trump, he has no desire to rush anything, and he also says that actually let's, first of all, let's make the aid to Ukraine a separate act, that is the most important thing is to separate you. S. Southern border aid and aid to Ukraine, that's what Republicans are demanding, then the Republicans will be able to accept funding for the southern states, first of all to the Republican states, and then they will be able to torment the Democrats about aid to Ukraine. And secondly, it is a loan, yes, to give Ukraine all this on credit, not as a grant, as Biden likes to do now, that is, by sending these millions without compensation, after all, they're coming from the American taxpayer and for the Biden family and for the American military-industrial complex, of course, there are only pluses here, there are always people in the American elite who lobby for all this, who benefit from the continuation of the war, first of all, it is the American military-industrial complex and, of course, the Biden family, which has been doing business in Ukraine since 2014. If all this goes on like this, it may even be possible to make it through the summer, once again, any delays in the provision of American aid are, of course, playing into Russia's hands, this is without any doubt at all, that's why the Democrats are so nervous and are trying to put pressure on Congress by any means necessary, there have been so many attempts, you and I have discussed them in my previous issues, but you just can't count them anymore both the Secretary of Defense and Biden. We're scared of sending U.S. troops, now he really says that it didn't happen, that is, the most vile methods were used, at the same time, what is interesting, I've decided to surprise you a little bit today. We're going to go to Italy, and I want you to listen to the speech of the ex-premier of Italy, in fact, addressed to the current Italian authorities and the current Prime Minister Meloni, well, listen to it, it sounds, first of all, quite interesting in Italian, let's listen to the Italian speech, well, and you always have the option of just reading it off the screen. Della scommessa che le ha fatto sulla vittoria militare sulla Russia. Ma lo vede un attimo, tutte le previsioni si sono rivelate fallimentari sulla vittoria militare, sul crollo dell'economia russa, sul crollo del regime di Putin. Che cosa abbiamo prodotto con questa strategia militare? Morti, distruzioni, il risultato di indebitare gli italiani per inviare sempre più armi ad oltranza per un'escalation senza fine e lei ha guadagnato come premio un bel bacio sulla testa per la fedeltà che ha promesso a Biden e, e, e che ha dimostrato nei confronti di Washington, ma non vuole neppure trattare con Putin e non vuole impegnarsi in un negoziato di pace. Questa è meno ipocrita Macron che fa un discorso lucido che non accettiamo assolutamente. E se lei, Presidente Meloni, non acconsentirà a mandare le nostre gruppe, truppe, perderà anche il paterno appoggio di Washington per il quale tanto ha faticato. La cosa più grave è che ha messo l'Italia in un vicolo cieco. Tutto questo perché non ha voluto riconoscere, in nome della nostra nobile tradizione e vocazione, che negoziare le migliori condizioni per l'Ucraina è l'unico modo per sfuggire alla terza guerra mondiale. Gli italiani non vogliono la terza guerra mondiale. Dove ci state portando? Well, such an energetic speech, of course, the speaker is not pro-Russian, of course, he is using the current situation to his advantage in order to lower Meloni's ratings. 
but what he's voicing is consistent with reality, when he talks about better terms for Ukraine, but they were, these very Istanbul talks, and what a stupid thing Zelensky did from Ukraine's point of view, when he just listened to Boris Johnson and all attempts at negotiation were over, once again, it was from Ukraine's point of view that the Istanbul talks were not the best period of Russian diplomacy for Russia, the conditions were weak, to put it mildly, that said, for Zelensky, what has changed since then? Referendums have taken place, new regions have joined Russia and the situation on the front has only started to improve, if Zelensky imagined an endless flow of money thanks to Johnson's promises, we see that the West's help is drying up, that is, it tends to run out, and it is not certain that there will be new aid, and, in fact, public opinion in Ukraine is no longer the same as it was in the first period, when there was such an upsurge, and everyone really believed in Zelensky and in the promises of the West to provide unprecedented support to Ukraine, once again, more and more politicians in Europe will start pressuring the current government to stop aid to Ukraine because it just doesn't make sense. Millions and billions are going into the abyss, there is no result. And how long will all this continue? Well, imagine, the French, Italians, Germans tell him that billions more are needed, he says, why, for Ukraine to improve its position, but Ukraine still won't negotiate, then why should it improve its position, to what limit will these positions improve, and hundreds of billions year after year just keep flowing into Zelensky's pocket, well, at the same time, we have other countries, as I said, the split in the West, the Anglo-Saxons, of course, are holding on very tightly, we have the next speaker from Australia, let's listen to this fragment. And it is critically important that the world stays the course right now to ensure that Ukraine is able to resolve this conflict on its terms. And the UK is right at the forefront of that. Uh, recently, we've announced a contribution uh, to the UK fund, which is supporting Ukraine, um, and we're very proud to do that. Uh, today we also announce that Australia will participate in the drone coalition, which is being led by both the United Kingdom and Latvia. Uh, and this is a really important opportunity for us to continue making our contribution to the effort uh, to have Ukraine stay the course and be able to resolve this conflict on its terms. And we will have more to say about that um, in the coming weeks and months. All that remains is to recall my traditional thesis about where Australia's interests are and where Ukraine is. Sorry, they don't breed kangaroos in Ukraine, you can't send them there. Well, let's just mind our own business. What is the Australian Defence Minister talking about? He's talking about us joining the drone coalition from Canada. Some record amounts are being sent. What's that? A British Empire that de facto still exists. And how do you explain that to all the voters of Australia and Canada? They've been told for years that they now have true sovereignty. Although in fact they are still monarchies and the head of state is the British king, it's an interesting scheme that's been invented. It was invented by the British Empire to keep up with the times and not to seem like such a rigid system that controls territories all over the world, you can think of World War I, World War II, there were a fair number of Australians fighting there, but what interests were they defending, the interests of the British Empire, now no one is sending Australian or Canadian soldiers, but they are sending billions, sending a huge amount of money that could be spent on their own development. Instead it's a struggle for British and US hegemony. So there you go, and, of course, it shows that there are no nationally oriented politicians out there who are thinking about their state, not in Canada, where Trudeau is hereditary, not in Australia, they're just not there, it's the very real globalists who are enjoying the gains in maintaining this globalist, elite hegemony. Finally, we should have at least some rhetorical response. Our politician Pyotr Tolstoy answered France very harshly, the interview is in French, because Peter Tolstoy speaks excellent French, he spoke out very harshly, but, in my opinion, it is really necessary, 
let it be quoted in the French media, let me play you a fragment and at the same time tell you what he was talking about. We will kill every French soldier who sets foot on Ukrainian soil, every last one of them, who cares what Macron thinks, you don't care what Macron says. Asks the journalist, absolutely not, and when will he say that he is ready to put no more limits on himself? Asks the French journalist again, we don't care about limits, we don't care about Macron or what he says or his limitations, we will kill French soldiers if they show up in Ukraine, is it okay that France is a nuclear power? Asks the journalist, well, yes. 200 missiles, so, we will kill every French soldier who comes to Ukrainian soil, every last one of them, as of today, if you don't count, 13,000 mercenaries have been there during the entire conflict, 367 of them French and 147 have been liquidated, 147 French citizens have already died in Ukraine, and we will kill the rest. You don't have to worry about that. This is the interview of Peter Tolstoy, in my opinion, this should be brought to the French electorate, exactly like this, exactly like this, perhaps then French public opinion will be able to scare Macron a little bit, and maybe Dmitry Medvedev's dreams will come true, that Macron will simply not start such steps, afraid of the possibility of destabilization inside France. Although my personal opinion is that destabilization due to sending troops to France is highly unlikely, for this purpose it is necessary to do a lot of work, to resist the French propaganda, which will reassure everyone, saying that we are actually sending the French Foreign Legion, and there are about 30% Russian speakers, so they will fight with their own, don't worry, French soldiers don't die. But the main thing is to win here, in this information struggle, and to see the current situation without illusions, by the way, we need to remind the French that their nuclear arsenal is ridiculous, Macron recently told the French press in an interview that France is a nuclear power, well, yes, as nuclear as Britain, just look at the number of warheads you have, if it weren't for the United States, you might not even exist on this planet, given your support for Ukraine. Well, our issue today has come to a close, I sincerely hope you enjoyed it.